Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and IP Labs. Hello again and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by Dan Peterson, the founder of of Flip Switch Marketing in the Chicago area. Dan is a small business owner and a marketing expert. Hi, Dan. How are you today? Good. How's it going, Gary? Doing great. Doing great. Before you got into uh, Flip Switch Marketing, you were heavily involved in fan- in your own family business for a lot of years. Can you talk a little bit about your experience growing up like that? Absolutely. So it's actually one of my favorite things to talk about, I think. Um I, I did. Like, as you said, I grew up in a uh, small town, small business. Um, my parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, they're all entrepreneurs uh, for the most part. And um, I practically lived in the retail store that they owned back in the day, uh, which was a Ben Franklin store. I, I speak very fondly of these Ben Franklin stores because for the, your listeners that may or may not know what that is, it was a precursor to Walmart. It was a small variety store, had everything from toys to crafts to stationery and everything in between. So uh, I practically lived there uh, until I was in high school, worked in the same town in the lumberyard industry for five, six years, and ended up managing and and basically running the entire building center yard part of that, Mm -hmm. uh, which was my first real chops in management. And then uh, went into the pizza industry, managed that for a couple of years. And that gave me that side of kind of retail restaurant space, you know, quick service stuff. Mm-hmm. And then um, got out of the business world in in more of the managerial side, was in a rock band for like five years, met my wife, uh, ended up moving up to Chicago. And that's when I got my first taste of entrepreneurship mm-hmm. in the door-to-door industry, actually. And I I did door-to-door sales for a couple of years and, and es- escalated very, very quickly in that. Um, within a matter of like six months, I- What was the I, product that you were- It was, uh, originally it was the AT&T legacy stuff. So phone, internet, uh, Dish Network was their partner at the time. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I was part of that transition into fiber when they went U-verse, uh, went to U-verse and all of that. So I ended up having a uh, part in three different offices. I, I managed one and owned two between Chicago, Central Illinois, and Houston. And did that um, until I got kind of sick of it. The industry kind of dried up. There was a lot of issues with markets and this and that. So I uh, worked a couple of private jobs with people and then realized that I wanted to go back into ownership again. And that's when Flip Switch came around in 2012. Mm -hmm. So I founded that, ended up building it into now a nationally recognized agency with clients in like 14 states at the moment or something like that. But we focus on small business. So to the original point, I carry that passion that I had from growing up in small business where I saw the struggles and all the the uh, pitfalls of you know trying to buy ads at a certain price or at the time it was yellow page ads, of course, and newspaper ads and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, the pricing was ironically, it's about the same as what you would pay for some of the digital stuff now, or at least from a monthly reoccurring plan with an agency like ours, you know, like four or 500 bucks a month, something like that. So, and that's where that pricing comes from. When I look back on, what you know, my family paid for in ads in certain cases, like let's say a four hundred dollars newspaper ad. Um, I try to kind of keep that pricing the same now in the digital space, where we provide that same level of service on mm-hmm. as the big agencies, but at a much much more affordable price. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's been a fun ride. It's been, uh, I mean, obviously I've worked in tons of different industries. I, I didn't even mention probably ten different things I, I did in that time mm-hmm. as well. But uh, but I have a lot of knowledge and background in small business. So Mm -hmm. flip switch has that now, you know, the capability to help that same industry of small business owners, Mm -hmm. but at scale. So what are some of the preconceptions people have in a small business about getting into digital marketing? Like everyone says they got to have a website. So they usually have a website of some sort. And obviously in the, in the photo printing industry or photo or the camera stores or people like that, that we've talked about, you know, they all have a website built in. But what are some of the first things they should be looking at in digital marketing? So one thing would be to kind of, and I talk about this a lot, to reverse engineer your audience. Mm -hmm. So who are you trying to sell to and where are those people at? Because one of the questions that we get and uh, one of the preconceived notions that we hear a lot is that uh, they either have to be on, they feel like they have to be on every channel 
every right. platform. Or on the flip side of that, they kind of have over the years stuck their head in the sand and not wanted to be on any of them. Right. Believe it or not, we still see people, especially older business owners, you know, that are maybe in their uh, 60s or 70s now that have still to this day not come up, you know, created a Facebook page or Instagram accounts or things like that. And it's like, where's your money going? Where would you got to be advertising somewhere? Where's that happening? So, <laughs> so we kind of see it on both sides. The both penny the saver. Spectrum. They put it in the penny saver. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, you know, it's funny. We hear all the time about a resurgence of print yeah. and um, yeah, there's time and space for printed um, mailers and things like that, obviously, but you have to build brand around multiple angles. It can't just be one or the other. And that means digital too. It can't be just digital, right? You have to be able to do print digital in-person events. I talk a lot about that, you know, yeah. building community. So yeah, I think the preconceived notions about digital that we see are that uh, it's too much work. I can't get started and ramp it up fast enough and I'm just going to forget about it anyway. So why start right. uh, a lot of that kind of mentality of, of not having the time. So how does someone determine what is the right amount or the right platform? So like you said, you reverse an engineer from the audience. So let's say, for example, uh, you're a uh, photo store and you're trying to reach the, the, the young kids who are now getting into shooting film, right? So you're talking mm-hmm. probably 25 and younger. So what would be a, a digital platform that they're on? Because they're probably not on Facebook. Not as much. No, they're, uh, you know, there's still an angle there. Uh, Facebook is kind of seeing a resurgence as at the time we're recording this year in early 23. Um, there is kind of a, a comeback of Facebook to a certain degree, but no, it's really for that age group. If I'm trying to reach that 25 and under or even 30 and under demographic, uh, I'd be heavy on TikTok and Instagram reels and Snapchat. Mm-hmm. And there's obviously different ways to use, utilize all three of those. But I'll tell you, Gary, the um, the crazy thing about like TikTok, for example, is the largest uh, growth segment population on there is the 30 to 50 year old range, 33 to 55, something like that. We're seeing a huge increase in that because it's the parents and grandparents getting on there to see their kids and grandkids do things. Right. Um, so it's aging up just like Instagram did. Instagram right. used to be teens and 20s. Now it's mm-hmm. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. What about some of the concerns people have about data privacy with some of these apps. I mean, obviously there's some concerns with TikTok being allegedly Chinese spyware, but people have concerns about Instagram. They have concerns about Facebook. Right. Should that something people should be concerned about as a marketer who want to use these platforms? I think as a business marketing it, uh, marketing yourself, I I don't see the concern. I really don't. I've, I've put a lot of thought on this. I've been asked a million times about it. Um, I always kind of, my wife and I've had these conversations. I always kind of talk to her about it and she kind of says the same thing. Like we have, you know, if you don't have anything to hide, what is the big deal? I guess is easy, you know, to put it simply. Um, yeah, there's some privacy stuff with everything, but I mean, you're, you're on the internet all day, every day, everybody's using it for everything. These are just one more platform that it's one of a million that people are using such as, uh, booking flights, booking hotels, shopping on Amazon. Right. They know about it. You know, everybody knows everything about everybody anyway. So right. what's one more platform? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, if you're trying to reach those people, um, is there any, is there like a bullet point uh, checklist of appropriate messaging for, for that sort of thing for those platforms? Because you don't want to just sit there and record a 40 second video of yourself, of your face, looking at the camera, talking about your film processing. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a visual language that you need to adopt for these platforms. Yeah, there is. So what I would say is to look internally at your brand, you know, whatever store you own, whatever company you're running, look at it from a 30,000 foot view and say, okay, not only who's my audience, but how do we want to be perceived by that audience? What do we want to look like? as a business? Do we want to be the fun, kitschy kind of, you know, targeting kids kind of thing? Do we want to target middle-aged people that are are already in the industry? Um, And it can be one, it can be both. It doesn't have to be one or the other, but then create your content based on that. So if you are trying to reach the younger demographic and you're trying to be fun and interesting and really drag that, you know, teen 20 something audience along Mm -hmm. for the ride and get them into film. um, I think the biggest thing that I could say would be 
telling your story and doing it from a fun, interesting, engaging method. So mm-hmm. when you create those TikTok videos or those reels, mm-hmm. make sure that they are on brand and that you're showing your audience the fun side of why you know, kind of like the why behind the what, why would a 20 year old, for example, want to get into film when they grew up with digital, right? What's the interest there? What makes it sexy? How do you get them involved? And then backward, you know, reverse engineer that story and start telling that story. So from the processing on the, you know, all the way through. So Sorry. one of the things I think is different uh, with younger video type consumers, right? These days is they are very interested in knowing how things are done. They do want to see the behind the scenes. Yes. Um, how would you recommend someone do that? I mean, would you actually take them back and show them how the film is processed? Is that something that yes. you ought to be doing? Yes. I, the answer to everything you're going to ask is going to be yes. So there's, <laughs> there is nothing really off limits as long as it's appropriate, obviously, and things like that. Everything else should be a yes. I would, I would create three or four videos a day for different platforms. Even if it's the same video and you repurpose it and you cut it differently and you, Mm -hmm. you know, edit it differently or whatever, I would use the same process across all the platforms of, right. Again, you're going to, you know, if people get sick of me probably saying this, but reverse engineering the whole process backwards. So Mm -hmm. TikTok, I'm trying to hit, let's say the 20, 30 year olds, I'd show a fun, cool edited thing to get, because it's all about attention. That's the whole thing. People forget that, everything that these platforms do is designed to keep you on the platform. Right. So how can you reverse engineer that and think, okay, TikTok wants to, they want me to have a million view videos, right? They want my videos to go viral. Right. I'm the one that has to create the viral video. So when you look at it through that lens as a business owner and you start coming up with fun, cool, engaging ideas that get the algorithms to pick it up, get the audience involved. The more the audience watches you, the more the algorithms show it. And it's a, it's a cycle. And now you're getting, I mean, I've seen clients of ours even that go from 200 followers on TikTok or reels to 10,000 literally overnight. My daughter did it. My four-year-old daughter locked herself in the bathroom. We recorded it because it was really funny. And she's got her little voice talking through the doors. I'm trying to talk her out of how to unlock it. (laughs) And it's the cutest thing ever. And I went to bed that night. I woke up in the morning. She had 12,000 followers and those videos had 1.6 million views. Wow. It's audience attention. So here, so here's the question though, you know, this is all well and good for the platforms. Cause like you Mm -hmm. said, their best interest to read the eyeballs, but how do you activate somebody to actually engage and transact? I think that's where a lot of the people in my audience struggle with is, you know, that's great. TikTok gets a thousand, you know, a million views for something I did. How mm-hmm. do I get people to buy something from my store? So once you've built up that brand recognition and people see it and they're familiar with it, even on a small scale, you're, you know, we're not talking like a national chain of stores here. You could be um, ABC photo in Podunk, Illinois. Mm-hmm. And if you've got the top account in your area that's driving you know, fun, engaging videos and recognition and things like that, brand recognition, Mm -hmm. people are naturally going to share it. They're going to uh, search for you more. Mm -hmm. And, and this is what we're seeing, for example, uh, with restaurants. Here's a great example. Google did a study that said that, you know, they, they were looking for how people in their, uh, I think it was Gen Z, they looked at how does Gen Z find restaurants? So everybody thinks, oh, you just Google it. No, they didn't Google it. 45 or 47% looked for a restaurant inside of Instagram and TikTok using Instagram and TikTok search capability to find a local restaurant. Wow. So Google freaked out because now half of their Gen Z audience <laughs> is telling them that they're not Googling it. It's, right. not the, it's not the results Google wanted from that study. Right. It goes to show you where things are headed. You know, these younger people are, are going on the platforms like TikTok, like Instagram Reels, and they're searching for businesses within those based on interests, based on hashtags, based on other things. And here, I think, is another answer to your question. The, these new platforms, especially like Instagram and Facebook Reels, they came about because of TikTok. Same thing with YouTube Shorts. Right. It's the TikTokification of everything, the short form video of everything. Right. They're all based on the interest graph, meaning that 
you see videos videos are pulled into your feed by the algorithm based on what you're interested in not based on just who you're connected to or friends with so when you're a small company and you're putting out content that is interesting and fun and relevant and engaging and all these other things and people start liking it sharing it Mm -hmm. that builds your brand to a point where you can then monetize it Mm -hmm. you can you you give value you show your story, you talk about how to do things, you know, the activation, so to speak, of like, how does somebody get into this, yeah. all of that. And then it's, oh, by the way, our store is located at 123 Main Street in Podunk, Illinois. You should stop in. Mm-hmm. We'll put you on a video ourselves. We'll make one with you. Come in. Yeah. Like, there's so many creative things you could do to take it right. from the screen to real life. Because I think that's one of the industry challenges we have because, you know, the number of pictures taken – this year is going to be on 1.3 trillion or something like that. That's yeah, crazy. And, and getting people to, to engage with that content and create a physical product is just an ongoing challenge, right? Because it's, I mean, it's, there are people who are super photo active who mm-hmm. know how to use various print apps or their local store or something or the kiosk at a CVS or something like that. And that's great. Right. But that market is always moving because people are aging into it, right? Yes. So you mentioned earlier Google. I was going to ask a question about Google and then you brought up Google. How mm-hmm. important is Google these days? Because no one seems to be talking when they when you read marketing speak or any of the new business news, no one's really talking about like optimizing for Google search anymore. Is that passe? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Photo retailers, energize your sales with ShareMe Chat, the proven texting platform. Using chat to text on your website keeps your customers connected and buying. See us at Pro and IPI to find out why dealers using ShareMe Chat close more sales without adding staff. Find out more at shareme.chat. No, it's still a thing. It's just the way that Google has changed their methods and their, and their structure. It's, it's much more organic based from a content standpoint. So like, for example, if you're a small business that has a website, you need to be creating a website that provides value in multiple ways. It could be having that written kind of updated blog or news section on there, but, you know, embedding video and really making it a a one-stop kind of shop for people, you know, just anybody, whether they're a shopper or they're just looking for, you know, um, not entertainment, but uh, looking for information. Google wants to give you still the best bang for your buck when it comes to search results. As a user, when I search something, I want the best three websites to come up or whatever. Right. Um, So it, it comes down to the business having to figure out how to make their site work in that realm. But AI, I mean, we haven't talked about that yet, but artificial intelligence is playing big into this stuff too. Because that's how a lot of these sites are starting to be found. It's how that's always worked, but it's definitely now how Google and Bing and these other sites are starting. I mean, look, Bing just acquired ChatGPT or partnered with them or whatever um, so that there's artificial intelligence at scale within Bing so that they can compete against Google. Everything's going that route of trying to get ahead of the curve, trying to figure out what the customer wants before the customer even knows what they want. So you have to think in that in those terms when you're doing anything content related. Well, that sounds like a lot of mental work. It's so, a ton of work. <laughs> so when you're talking to clients, <laughs> what are you suggesting to them to what places to start? Well, so two things. One is to not overjudge and overextend yourself. You know, if you can't get it done, you just can't get it done. Right. But at the end of the day. Which is the reality of small businesses. Right. 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 But if we were all truly to be honest with ourselves, myself included, everybody's got an extra 10 or 20 minutes a day. Mm. Everybody. I don't care if you're working 18, 19 hours a day, you've got 10 or 20 extra minutes. You cut your lunch break by 10 minutes. You take a shorter bathroom break. You, you find 10 minutes in there. And then in that 10 minutes, what can you accomplish? Or you do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night. And that's when you take a quick 30 second video, you post it, you put some caption to it. There's always some extra time in there. And I think that it's more of, I don't want to say the willingness, but it's the, um, the tired kind of mindset that small businesses carry because you are so we are so busy as business owners. Mm-hmm. We know we have that extra 10 or 20 minutes, but it's like, 
I'd rather just sit down. <laughs> right. I'd rather just breathe. I'd rather have a cup of coffee. Right. So there's a little bit of discipline involved with some of this stuff for some people. And then there's a lot of business owners that don't work as much as they think. I mean, I know some of our clients, like they stand around their shop for two or three hours a day, really not doing much. Mm -hmm. Or they have an employee that certainly needs to do something and they can only sweep the floor so many times. Right. And that's where you build culture around marketing so that in downtime, You've got that 20 year old employee who's making that content for you internally and they're doing a 10 times better job than you or i could do because we're you know 40 50 60 years old or whatever so so simply put what are some of the top line metrics like you said that older business owner may use to gauge whether that 20 year old employee is actually doing something effective or just building a portfolio for their own use right yeah, great question. Um, I think it comes down to uh, having a strong brand message up front. So knowing who you are and all of that and making sure that they're on board with that. And then tracking, there's basic numbers you can look at. All these platforms provide them very easily. Um, and you can look at reach. You can look at engagement. So how many people are seeing your posts? How many people are liking, clicking, commenting, sharing, taking action on your posts? And then if you've got some kind of call to action built in, like a coupon or a sale or a, mm -hmm. um, just anything that's clickable, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. you can track that, of course, and say, okay, well, we sent, uh, you know, this ad had 120 clicks on the website link. So they we know that 120 people potentially went to the website. Well, what did they go there for? Mm -hmm. And this is where a little extra effort kicks in. You got to have like Google Analytics and you got to be running something on your website that tells people, uh, it tells the business owner like, what are people doing when they get to my website? Are they buying something? Are they yeah. signing up for a newsletter or whatever the call to action is? So, but it, basic metrics can go a long way. I think people try, you know, I had this conversation this week, actually. I think people try to overcomplicate social media sometimes and think like, oh, I need all this data and all these metrics and all this stuff. And when in reality, like if you're reaching a thousand people now and you put the pedal down and next month you reach 10,000 people and the month after that, after that you reach 20,000 people, then you start putting in some calls to action and getting them to click and convert over to your website and this and that, like within six months, you can easily watch the progression of A to C or A to D mm -hmm. as it goes through phases of reach and right. then conversion and then sales and real dollars. And it doesn't take any extra programming or anything like that. It's all built into these platforms. So it's, it's quick and easy. But um, one thing I want to talk on really quick that came to mind a few minutes ago is you know, you mentioned like, how do we take this digital world, whether it's creating videos on TikTok or Reels or whatever we're doing, and get people to take action then and become actual customers in a physical mom and pop brick and mortar, right? Right. And this is where creativity comes in. Mm -hmm. This is where you've got to figure out how to break that wall between the digital and the real world space and get people to walk through the door. Whether that is, and I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the real world side of things, the in-person side, whether that's having something that carries over from a, a marketing standpoint where like a contest, for example, here's just a quick off the top of my head thing. Have a contest for people that want to be involved in this thing. Print off your favorite photo from, you know, it could be your, a silly photo content, you know, something, whatever, like they print it, they get it on their tangible thing in their hand that is printed on, and then they have to come into the store or come to the store to pick it up or whatever. And they, you get them out of the digital space and you get them to walk through the door. And then you create a video with that content and you show, Hey, we got 10 people that came in with this uh, Christmas ornament in, our, in their hand that has their funny dog's picture on it or whatever. Right. And then you vote and have everybody vote. And if they vote, they get a entered into a $500 gift card, mm -hmm. something like that. You know, you put a prize that's actually worth getting. Right. And you, you have a process. And you do this, and we have clients that do this on a monthly basis. Right. Every month, they have something like this where it takes them digital, in the door, they win a prize, and they have to share it to win it, and they have to win it, share it. Like, it's this whole ecosystem that they've built. And it works wonders. It's huge. You know, and I think what's important in that type of offering is to actually follow through and mention the winners. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people promote photo contests and they, and they never announce the winners. Yes, you're 100% correct. It, it boggles my mind because I think, yeah. you know, it's like, hey, we hey, we did a photo contest. We've checked that box. But it's like, <laughs> well, no, you haven't actually capitalized on making your customers a hero. Right. 
to their to the audience, right? Because who doesn't want to see their if they're enter a contest to see that rewarded and shared and recognized? Right. And another type of creative thing too is to get involved in the community with this. Mm -hmm. How can you, as a small business that does photo printing and and photo creation and processing and all this, how can you get into other organizations, maybe non for profits or somebody else that you can partner with, and then at you're basically leveraging those businesses and those organizations to help promote you because now the school district or somebody is utilizing you for a giveaway that is benefiting people with uh, Alzheimer's or Down syndrome. I mean, there's that it's the creative thing that I think a lot of small businesses in every industry lack they lack ideas because they're they've been in their business for so long they can't they're just burnt out to a certain degree and they just can't come up with new creative ways to integrate digital and real life and put it all together and and make it fun and engaging which that may be the time you look around your store and you find the 20 year old guy who's leaning against the counter that's it or those those kids yes those kids have more creativity in their little fingers sometimes than Mm -hmm. we middle age and on up people have ever had in our body because they see it every day they live in this ecosystem of of tiktok videos and when i say that i mean everything youtube shorts instagram reels it's all the tiktok style right. short form video right and getting those people to produce stuff for you and attract their age group is the number one way that an aging up industry like film can crack that third wall and get down there to that younger generation. So yeah, there's a lot of it again to not to beat a dead horse. It's creativity Mm -hmm. in the process and the mindset all the way through to execution. You just have to be creative so that you're not the same as every other business. And don't feel like you have to do it all yourself, which I think is very typical of small business owners, right? Right. Is I'm going to get there early. I'm going to sweep the floor. I'm going to do the cash register. I'm going to unlock the door. And now I have to do videos. It's just too much. Yeah, but. it is. It's it is too much for a lot of them. And not to make this any kind of commercial for Flip Switch, but just so you know, this I had to change my business model because of this exact thing. So we've always done the social media for businesses, and we still do, right? The posting, the monitoring, all of it. But we've recently, in the last uh, nine, ten months, added a heavy level of coaching for a lot of clients, mm-hmm. where they have that twenty year old in staff. They right. that needs direction. They need some kind of management and that's what we do we provide a blueprint we give it to them they execute it for the month the next month we come back go over it by you know rinse repeat Mm -hmm. and that's going over gangbusters because it's providing not only the level of direction but it's also uh all the it's all of it it's a creative it's Mm -hmm. it's everything so i had to add that just because of exactly what we're talking about now the other piece of this though is you know sort of the discipline piece to know you can't do everything Right. Right. So can you talk a little bit about recognizing that? Yeah. It's having that self-realization of what you're good at and what you're not. Mm -hmm. And this is a big issue with all industries for small, especially for small business owners is trying to wear all the hats and doing so with ego, not letting go, not letting that 20 year old do the, do the thing that they're good at and not having some trust factor there because Mm -hmm. at some point you have to let go of things Mm -hmm. and that revolves around trust and it revolves around the ability to oversee it without micromanaging. Right. And that's a hard thing for a lot of business owners to do. Yeah. So once you can master that Mm -hmm. and you can realize like, Hey, I'm going to trust Sally to do this video and she's, I'm going to task her with doing five videos a week, one every business day. And at the end of the month, if she does it, I'm going to bonus her. Uh, if we hit certain metrics, I bonus her again and like creating a fun, but also profitable environment for her to mm-hmm. be able to execute on the creative and at the same time build, you know, in all honesty, build a portfolio because she probably won't work there her whole life. And maybe she wants to go or maybe she is going to college for something and she wants to go to the next executive level and, and be the CMO someday of somewhere. And she can look back and be like, hey, look, when I was only 20. I elevated this place from this to this and that they the revenue increased by this percent. And right. I mean, these are real life things that can happen and, and they do happen every day. They just don't happen where you and I hear about them. <laughs> right. You know, it's not something you hear on the news. So do you have any like tips or suggestions for engaging through this concepts you're walking through? Maybe like some, you know, a checklist. 
Yeah. So I actually got like five different things here that I can, I can say, if you want to do a quick, as a business owner, if you're listening to this, you want to do a quick uh, overview and kind of summary of what your business is doing or not doing. Here's a quick checklist you can have. So look at number one, your professional brand. Do you have, and this sounds silly. Some of you are going to be like, well, of course I have this. Do you have a logo mm -hmm. or are you using a 10 year old photo as your profile picture on Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. like you need a logo, you need somebody to know who you are. You would never go to Walgreens or McDonald's or anywhere else with a different logo in every different building. Why don't you have a logo? And that's the number one thing. And, the, and brand goes way beyond logo, but it, mm -hmm. it starts there. And then building around a concept of what your brand is about right. from both a mental and creative standpoint, all the way through to your product and service. Uh, number two is the personal brand as the owner, you might need to be the face of the business. Right. You you need somebody, I'll put it this way, somebody needs to be the face of the business. Right. So you need to get out from behind the counter, get in front of the camera. If you hate doing in front of the camera, then then just talk or you know be behind the camera and talk through it or get somebody else. That's where that self-realization comes through and, and knowing what you're good at and what you're not. Not everybody's meant to be on camera by any means. Pricing, like how is your pricing and your service compared to everybody else? Sometimes right. we see... I mean, I see it probably 10 times a year or more businesses that have a great business model, but they're either way underpriced and, and have no perceived value right? or they're way overpriced and can't compete. And they have right. to figure out different ways to come back into their normal market pricing. Sure. Uh, platforms is the next one. Figure out which ones are best for your audience and go on them and go heavy. But mm -hmm. you have to be present on these platforms. And when I say present, I don't mean post and forget it. You need to be going in, for example, let's say um, I have a Photoshop in, um, I'll just say Champaign, Illinois, because that's where I used to live. So a town, let's say 100,000 people, and I've got a store there, uh, to, you know, that would be like what your small business owners listening own. And I'm on these platforms. I need to be going in on each one that I'm active on. So we'll just say right now, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, let's just say those three. I'm going to go in every day into the comments of all of the relevant conversations that are going on, whether it's somebody post a cute picture of their dog, or it's somebody having their high school photos done, or it's, you know, anything that's relevant, even, even 10 degrees out. And I'm going to go in, I'm going to make thoughtful comments in every one of those conversations. I'm going to do it right. 10 or 20 times a day. So you're talking a hundred, probably 50 minimum up to a hundred comments per week that you're doing in these threads. And they're all going to be non-sales. They're strictly going to be, hey, that's a really cute picture of that dog. What kind of dog is that? Right. Or, oh, your son is growing up. I have a daughter who's graduating this year too. Just thoughtful comments. That builds your brand, on, especially on Instagram, what I'm talking about here, faster than anything you'll ever do. You want to build a business on Instagram, that's the first thing you do is you're, you post and you're present and you're commenting on people's posts. So professional brand, personal brand, pricing platforms and then the process itself you got to document your process you got to show people what your business is doing mm -hmm. for example i'm 44 years old and i don't i have not been in a photoshop or ty type of business that you're talking about in a long long time i grew up with it in fact my grandparents even uh had a photo processing thing in their basement a dark room in their okay. basement with all the you know the silver and all that um and so i have a uh, nostalgic affinity for that but I wouldn't go out of my way to go see it or pro or be a part of it unless I had somebody remind me of how nostalgic that is. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody showed videos, if you told your story on TikTok or Reels or whatever, and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Like, I remember growing up in the 80s and seeing this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to that store and just be a part of this. Or I'm going to get stuff printed out because I just love the way that I can hold something in my hand and not have a digital you know, 10,000 photos on my camera, on my phone. Like right. when you touch on the emotion, this is sales 101, right? Like you touch on that emotional side, right. that nostalgia, that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. The only difference now, Gary, is that people can do it at scale. They can do it in mass because of digital. They can show right. a million people potentially or more the same story that you, you know, 10 years ago, you would not have been able to tell. You would have had to have them come to your store to see it or be on a TV show or a TV commercial. Now you can... You got your phone in your hand. People can watch your process all day, every day on YouTube. Mm -hmm. We didn't even talk about that. But from a process standpoint, really quick note, 
I would build a YouTube channel if I had one of these stores mm -hmm. and I would create how to videos on every one of these. I would tell the entire process of how to do exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I would show the process of ordering online, how to get the print thing created, send it to, you know, like for the older crowd that might not be good on that website on, on how to get their printed thing done, mm -hmm. show it, you know, screen record and show the process. I would do all of this hours and hours and hours and hours of work up front so that it sits there for eternity on digital and people can reference it as kind of a library for years to come mm -hmm. it's what we call evergreen content so that's it if you if you had to look at everything from a thirty thousand foot view that's what i would do the branding personal and professional pricing platforms and process awesome well thank you dan for your time and your expertise where can people go to learn more about flip switch social media well, we are everywhere at Flip Switch Social Media. You can pretty much Google that. Um, but uh, I also have my personal brand, which is Dan Peterson Official, that I'm slowly building. I'm, that's in my back pocket. I don't put a lot of time like I should into it. But uh, but either one of those, you can find well, Everyone's me got 10 minutes, Dan. Everybody's got 10 minutes. And you know what? I, I always say this. I tell people what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, on, especially my personal brand, that whole personal brand is really just me talking to myself. A hundred percent, that's all it is. Um, all the advice I give is really just for me. But uh, no, in, in all honesty, like I really want to give value and anybody that's listening to this, reach out. I'm not going to charge you. I'm not a lawyer going to charge you by the dime. If you just have questions, just comments, concerns, anything you need, um, it would be my pleasure to have a call or chat with you and, and help you and you know, it's not a sales shtick. It's just trying to help small business owners. That's why I started the company. So thank you so much for your time and uh, best wishes and on your future success. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. Read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com.